Church here altered as with the Protestant domination in the 13 Angus Cotton did not lose a chance to make a buck off the enslavement of the Africans. This was done under the fraudulent pretense of saving souls and civilizing the native and African peoples. The Catholic Church maintained a position on the board of directors of the Company of the Indies and was represented there by Abbe Ragnar in the 1720s. Even when the company was dissolved and the colonies' direction reverted back to the king of France, the Roman Catholic Church retained its prominent position in directing the proportions of slavery in the colony. Its clergy received a handsome salary from the state. The church, jointly with the French and Spanish crown, laid down the oppressive black codes, which were the supreme laws revigorating the yoke of bondage around the neck of the Africans. Now can one forget the Catholic Church was the state religion of the colony, so it had a special and dominant position in defining and protecting slavery in Louisiana. Regular church premises were used to conduct the awful business of trafficking in Africans. For example, the following transaction is recorded in the original Acts of the St. Charles Parish in 1774. At the door of the church, Belly sold a slave named Pierre, a native of San Dominica, belonged to board to Augustine D. McCarthy. In fact, the Catholic Church, through all of its agencies and order, directly benefited financially from slavery. This was the real reason for the rise and spread of the Jesuits. Copen Chin, Dominican, and Ursuline orders in Louisiana. There were essentially agents of the colonizers whose job it was to pacify the conquered, to get them to accept the awful situation. These orders maintained their own plantations where African and Native American slave labor was sadly exploited. Early on in 1726 to 1763, the Jesuits was granted a huge chunk of land for a plantation in and on the border of the city of New Orleans. Today, the borders of this estate will be from the Mississippi River along Commerce Street, north to Broad Street, and upriver to Vanessa Street. This tract of land later became known as the Fallbird of St. Mary. At the peak of his operation around 1750, the Jesuit plantation was run using 130 African slaves. When it was finally sold in 1773, the plantation was operated with some 45 Africans. Early on, the Copen Chains had two plantations, one with 30 slaves in the Gentile area that produced Indigo and another about three miles down the river from New Orleans. Not only this, the Copen Chains were noted for their specialty activities for buying and selling slaves for the commercial profit unconnected with production. The Ursuline order from the same practices and the Jesuits and Copa chains, the Ursulines were provided with the plantation upriver for New Orleans, its lower boundary line being for Lynchester Street to date. It was a large estate similar to that of the Jesuits. The Ursuline now bought an African slave with, the name, with them from Europe to this country. The same slave described as a Moor was already in bondage on church lands in France. When they arrived, the company of the Indies gave them eight Africans to begin production. Eventually, the number became much larger. The nuns actively engaged in the selling of slaves like the other slave owners when they sued their economic interests. In 1739, Jacob, a 13-year-old boy, was sold to the company of the Indies because it was alleged he was an unmanageable. The money received about 15 lire helped pay for the domestic expenses since their debts at the time were high. Seven years later, a Negro woman was sold. In 1756, the superior sister, Maria Bonat de Carrera de Saint Teresa, sold six Africans. She was made out that they were corrupting the other slaves, apparently for practicing the African religions and apparently and other customs. One was accused of fire worship. Thus, Joseph Marie, Marie John, Dennis, Augusta Marie, and Isidore were put on the center block to purge the plantation of these wicked subjects. Mother, Mother 
Marisa, Mother Marie Teresa Landell of St. Jacques arranged for the purchase and sale of several slaves in 1759. All right. Okay. In 1763, Sister St. Louis, Sister St. Louis de Ghana sold three slaves she labeled Eva Southern. The sisters admitted that money was needed at the time and the nuns secured it through the sale of these trouble some slaves. The church took great pride in what they called Christianizing and humanizing the slaves by trying to wipe out the African culture. During Father Borello stayed as pastor in St. Maria, Bill, beginning in 1823, it is reported by church officials that he objected sternly to the custom of the Congo Negro slaves gathering every Sunday in the open space before the church, where they conducted their dances which they had bought with them from Africa. These dances gradually disappeared under the influence of Father Borello and through his institution, the Negro ceased his activity. It is not surprising that the church doctrine sanctioned slavery since the already derived a good life of luxury from it. The enormous accumulation of wealth and land and money in their possession today is a direct result of wealth stolen from the native people and the unpaid labor of the Africans. During all periods of slavery in Louisiana, the church had a big financial stake in preserving the existing order. Thus, they rigorously worked to indoctrinate the slave with the idea that slavery was the divine order of God. The slave was told that he must obey the master and submit to exploration. Understanding the church was a major sin of propagating and spousing the foul ideology of white supremacy, the sermon books and other outlets especially urged all of that the African was subhuman and stamped by an original sin because of his color. In the eye of the slave master was justified in ruling the slave since it was a condition sanctioned by God. Naturally, hatred for the Catholic church was widespread amongst the Africans during slavery. The majority of Africans resisted all attempts to compel them to accept Catholicism. Many of the revolts were motivated by the determination of the slaves not only to resist their economic and political oppression, but also the oppression of the church. In the same case, the slaves outwardly accepted Catholicism but intermixed worship of their African gods with the saints as a compromise. All slave revolts that followed had a, had a dexterly anti-Catholic, anti-Christian age to them. Even after the Civil War, strong anti-Catholic moves were built amongst the former slaves. And that's uh, from Louisiana here was slave revolt, you know what I'm saying? So that is telling you how when you go there and you worship the church and all these preachers, pastors, and all these other people out here, you know what I'm saying? That's bothering now to his Roman Catholicism. You know what I'm saying? This is what they really uphold it because these are the people that went on and benefit from that. And if you notice, I said that it was more that was in there describing that, you know what I'm saying? So uh, that's Louisiana, 18th level Louisiana slave revolt. You know what I'm saying? Part three, we talked about that, you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to wrap it up on that. I'm no more as God. I'm saying peace. It's not. I love my freedom.